Good morning, everybody. My name is Michaela Calhoun. I'm a second year law student and a fellow for the Byron R. White Constitutional Law Center. I am thrilled and honored to be moderating your first panel, Responsibility in the Face of Civil Rights Regression. This panel will explore how the Supreme Court's recent decisions have impacted civil rights in the US criminal justice and in some indigenous legal systems. Panelists consider how litigation at the state rather than the federal level might bolster protections for some of the most vulnerable communities. Allow me to introduce you to our panelists. I'm going to keep our bio short because they are really fired up from our keynote. <laughs> First, we have Professor Matthew Fletcher. He is an expert in Native American and tribal law. Next, we have Siddhartha Rathod. He is also an expert in civil rights litigation. And third, we have Ms. Tonya Boyd. She is the co-director of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and or associate director of counsel. Uh, she was on the selection, preparation, and confirmation of federal judicial nominees, including the DC Circuit Supreme Court nominee, Kintanji Brown Jackson. Without further ado, let's get started into our conversation. And in the order of introduction, I would like each panelist to set the framework for our conversation. What is the current state of civil rights and how did we get here? Is that me first? Yes. <laughs> well, it's atrocious. How did we get here is we are, as uh, Professor Shapiro said, property rights constitution. All right. So, um, wow, that's a lot louder now. It does definitely excludes a bunch of people. The whole point of the social contract and like any contract is exclusion. Some people are in, some people are out. Uh, if you look at the Declaration of Independence and the text of the Constitution, you'll see there are lots of people excluded. Yeah, we've modified the Constitution over the years, but you'll note that nobody talks about the 19th Amendment or the 14th Amendment or the 13th Amendment or the 15th Amendment much anymore. And Indians are still in the Fifth Amendment as being excluded from the text of the Constitution. So Indians did not um, get citizenship, most of them, until 1924 through an act of Congress. And one wonders, could Congress repeal that citizenship? We can talk about that later uh, as an aside, but that's why we are where we are now. And um, just, just to let you know, when it comes to Indian law, uh, the rule of thumb is, at least in the last 30 or 40 years, if the Supreme Court wants to, to tinker with something in civil rights, it usually takes a case involving Indian people. So on religious freedom, we got a trilogy of cases, Employment Division versus Smith, Bowen versus Roy, Northwest Protective Cemetery versus Ling, all cases where the Supreme Court gutted um, free exercise for people who are native, for people of color with minority religions. And where you see the um, sort of the end of the enforcement of civil rights, the beginning of the end was the rise of the 11th Amendment and Seminole Tribe versus Florida, which is an Indian gaming case but it led to a whole series of cases involving states' rights, assertions of sovereignty over lawsuits, um, or to, to uh, stop lawsuits brought to enforceable rights. And uh, basically Indian, and there are election cases, Indians are used by the Supreme Court because nobody pays attention to it. And they can get away with a lot of shit that they otherwise would not be able to. I mean, that's over now, now that they have a super majority and do whatever they want and nobody can stop them. But when Indians are at play, people just sort of say, that's okay, it's Indian law, we can let it go. And that's a small sliver of the story of why we are where we are. And I'll turn it over to others to talk more. Thanks, Matthew. Mm -hmm. You know, I uh, was listening to uh, Professor Shapiro speak uh, uh, with the rest of you, and it was fascinating. But this has been going on for generations and generations and generations. The people at this table, or the people who look like the people at this table, have not had democracy in this country. And, you know, SCOTUS has leaned conservative, as far as I'm concerned, for, you know, generations, and only been dragged into progressive issues for generations. BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color, uh, have been suffering 
in this country for a very, very long time and have been excluded from democracy. Uh, and with no offense to anyone, I think with Trump, the erosion of voter rights, the Dobbs decision, many Americans are finally waking up to the America we live in. And it hasn't been great. It, 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 it has not been for our people a, this bastion uh, that only recently in the last you know, six to eight years has been eroded. It just never existed. So I, I'm, I'm going to echo uh, what Matthew said. And indigenous people in this country have had it you know, equally bad or worse. Um, so I, the immigrant experience, the African American experience, these are experiences that I think uh, white America have ignored. And only with, and I'll kind of switch into civil rights here, with the kind of expansion of uh, technology. So with body cameras, halo cameras, all these different types of things, cell phone cameras, are now the uh, American public seeing the experience of the BIPOC community live out every day, their interactions with the area I focus in, the, uh, their interaction with police, their interaction with um, government officials, uh, companies, and things like that. We're now seeing more recordings and employment law and things like that. That are people are starting to get outraged at, oh my goodness, look what happened to George Floyd. Not, oh my goodness, look at what happened to George Floyd. Look what happened for the past generations and generations of abuse. And we haven't had the democracy. Now, we want a strong, I understand the desire to have a strong universal federal rights of human rights and dignity of all people, BIPOC or, or, or not. And I think that's absolutely critical and absolutely important. Um, but we've never had it. And we've been excluded from that. And so maybe uh, it's the states are the place where we can get that. And so looking, and I know it's different for tribal law, um, but you know, in Colorado, uh, we've had a very progressive path, you know, with, you know, 2013, the Cata Remedies Bill, basically emulating Title VII rights into state, 2008, the recognition of sexual orientation, discrimination, 2021, adding gender identity and gender expression, uh, 2021, expanding the time period to file charges of discrimination, um, adding additional rights, you have 2022, including domestic workers, 2022 again going in effect in 2023, the Colorado Wage Claim Act, expanding the rights of workers. And I'm only focusing on the Colorado ones that are uh, in employment there. And then you have SB 217, the police accountability bill that went into effect uh, during the George Floyd protests or was passed during the George Floyd protests, which is the most progressive police accountability bill uh, eliminating qualified immunity, requiring the wearing of body cameras and et cetera um, in Colorado. And it's the most progressive in the nation. So these things have make me proud to live here where maybe we'll be able to participate in the dem democratic experience a little bit more. Wow, well, it is um, hard to follow such um, incisive commentary on the state of where we are in terms of civil rights, but I will um, try to do my best following Matthew and Siddhartha's opening. Uh, so my name is Tona Boyd and I am the Associate Director Counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, and that is an organization that since its founding in 1940 has really been striving and at the forefront of defending and protecting civil rights uh, and racial justice in this country. Uh, 
Um, and LDF's mission really has been to leverage and use the power of law, of narrative, of research, and of people to defend and advance the full dignity and citizenship of Black people in this country. Uh, and we have really been striving for more than 80 years to realize the promise of a multiracial, multi-ethnic uh, democracy in which power is shared, dignity is sacred, and thriving is the standard. Um, but what we've seen really, and whether, the, whether or not that's what's been reflected in our history books um, or the lived experience of our ancestors or indeed in the news cycles of 2023 um, are the ways in which our country has really failed to live up to the promises of our constitution. And we have failed to really realize the words that are etched in stone on the facade of the Supreme Court, equal justice under law. In fact, I would say that we are at an inflection point when it comes to realizing the full dignity and citizenship of Black people in America. So our current system of law enforcement, for example, too often fails to keep our communities safe and disproportionately targets and harms Black communities and communities of color. Black people are killed by law enforcement at twice the rate of white people in America. Truth is under assault. So I think all of us would agree that every child has the right to an accurate, an honest, and an inclusive public education that reflects the truth of this nation's history and that celebrates the lived experiences of Black people, Brown people, Indigenous people, women, LGBTQ people, non-binary and trans people. But we're seeing unrelenting and increasing attacks and attempts to erase the lived experiences of these communities from our books, from our libraries, from our classrooms, from our universities. Vestiges of school segregation remain. Access to the ballot and voting rights has been eroded by the judiciary. We heard earlier about uh, Shelby County, uh, which we're just about to mark the 10th anniversary of that decision, uh, which gutted a key tool in protecting voting rights. And we're seeing efforts to further erode those hard fought rights across uh, legislatures across the country. Black people remain the targets of economic injustice, wealth disparity, housing and banking discrimination and environmental racism. And it's in the face of these alarming trends that we're also seeing concerted efforts to undermine the will of black people in local jurisdictions from Jackson, Mississippi, and the efforts to usurp the authority of local elected judges to Washington, DC, where congressional efforts are underway to overturn local criminal justice and police reform to the appalling expulsion of two black representatives in Tennessee. So it is against this backdrop when we most need the rule of law when we most need the ability to seek redress through our court system, that we've seen efforts to undermine long-standing precedents that protected the bedrock of our democracy, from voting rights to affirmative action to reproductive rights. And so I think we find ourselves now asking first, can we continue to rely on the federal courts to protect and vindicate and defend our core constitutional rights. And if not there, where? And how do we continue the very critical work of furthering civil rights and racial justice and striving to make our union more perfect? So I am looking forward to the conversation with our panelists. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's pivot and start to discuss the Supreme Court's role in shaping our current state of affairs. Uh, Matthew, you discussed this social contract 
Um, and Siddhartha and Tona, you both discuss how it's very apparent that our constitution and our federal government has not always protected the civil rights of marginalized communities. Uh, Matthew, I would like to start with you. Can you talk more about how this social contract is within the Supreme Court's interpretation and contributes to the harms that we're discussing? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, the social contract is something that um, was theorized centuries ago, and at least in part because of interactions between the colonizers in the early centuries in, in the Western Hemisphere and uh, in Indians. Actually, the, the dawn of everything is a new book that came out last year that theorizes that lots of colonizers came over, met Indians, and learned that they don't have to follow uh, a monopoly on violence. They don't have to follow their emperor or their pope. They could actually vote and you know, make decisions for themselves. Indians would laugh at the colonizers and say, why are you doing what your king says? Who's this guy? Have you ever met him? Does anything he say make any sense? So they go back to Europe, and they found out that they had come up with a new legal, uh, legal and polit political theory to justify all this, and that's where you get the social contract. Um, it's a theory that is rooted in a monopoly on violence. It's a theory rooted in the empirically false assumption that humans are violent, dangerous, um, selfish, and uh, would just all, we would all just kill each other unless there was some sort of you know, wealthy political elite that would keep us in line. Um, it was a rationalization for something that uh, is uh, empirically false. No civilization ever would have existed if, if that theory was actually um, viable. And yet we've had thousands upon thousands of civilizations throughout the history, um, most especially here in the Western Hemisphere, without really much of that kind of thing. So if you look at the social contract, really it's about preserving the, uh, including under the protections of the political elite at the time of the founding of the Constitution, a limited number of people. Everyone else is excluded. Indians certainly were in the text of the Constitution. The euphemism of three-fifths of other persons were excluded. Women were excluded. People without property were excluded. Really, as a practical matter, even to this day, people without resources to uh, use law uh, lawyers and lobbyists uh, uh, are also excluded effectively from the social contract. And the way that policing works is at any given moment, a cop can decide that you're um, engaging in an illegal act, which removes you immediately from uh, the protections of the social contract. Now, why is this relevant in the way the Supreme Court interprets uh, statutes and the text of the Constitution? Well, we've had a uh, it's pretty apparent that the court is interested in what the founders thought about the text of the Constitution. Um, and it's also apparent that um, the court doesn't care about what Congress thinks the text of the Constitution means. And um, so what that means is they're really interested as a textualist court, and that's really what I'm getting into, textualist. Um, they're really interested in protecting the original understanding of that social contract, which is wealthy political elites who tend to be white, tend to be white men, um, and not minorities, not people who are poor. And um, that's, that's sort of the overarching thing. Textual, textualism is a really convenient way to elevate the interests of the wealthy political elite and um, who tend to be white guys. So, um, you know, so when we look at the text of, the, of a statute, you know, the, the court gets out the, the, the definition, the, the dictionary which is, leads to some of the most ridiculous lines of court opinions. There was an Indian law case a few years ago during COVID where, um, called Chehalis Tribes versus Yellen, where the court engaged in a debate over the use of the word, um, uh, shit, I'm totally blanking on this. What is it that the, the fish that you eat raw, but it's cooked with lime? Not sushi. Ceviche. Ceviche. <laughs> so it's ceviche, and they had a debate over a cookbook use of the word ceviche, um, and, and that's their statutory line of analysis. Nobody gave a shit in that opinion about the reality of that case, which was the Trump administration wanted to do a giveaway to Alaska Native corporations who were for profit of CARES Act money. And the reason they wanted to do that is because those corporations tend to be, be involved in oil and gas and extractive resources industries, which is very much a Trump thing. So they put the right person in to interpret the statute who came from Alaska Native Corporation. And maybe that's a good thing, normatively, or a bad thing. I don't really know. But none of that at all was part of this discussion. And to me, that's all that mattered in that case. If you just look at the lineup of the attorneys on either side, one side you had a bunch of oil and gas attorneys who happened to be do, involved in a CARES Act interpretation case. And the other side was a bunch of lefty environmental justice type attorneys 
Um, and none of these things, these attorneys would not seem to be the ones that you would have in a case like this, but here they were. And this is what textualism is. It divorces the text of the, line, of the law. It divorces the, the intent of Congress, the typical types of statutory interpretation that existed certainly when I was in law school in the 1990s and are sort of got fallen off a cliff. And uh, this is all designed to ensure that the voices of people in our democracy um, are silenced, absolutely silenced. And so um, that's why when in, in Indian law, we actually have a separate rule of statutory construction, um, several of them actually, but the one I'm gonna focus on has to do with, um, comes from 1974. And the, the rule basically is, an act of Congress in Indian affairs is constitutional so long as it is rationally related to the fulfillment of the trust responsibility. Now those are, there are a lot of terms in there that are very unique to Indian law, but basically it, it derives from the text of the Constitution because Indians and tribes are the only ethnic ethnicities and ethnic entities um, mentioned in the Constitution. So at some point, Congress has to make a decision. Who are Indians and what is an Indian tribe? And they've been doing it since 1790. And way back in the day, the way they defined Indians was you knew one when you, see, when you saw one, which is not a particularly helpful definition, but that's the founders. That's what they think of. And I think we're moving in that direction again. So, but in the modern era, I'm gonna focus on the Indian Child Welfare Act, which says this statute applies to Indian children in state courts. So the question is, who's an Indian? Well, Congress actually gave a definition of Indian. The definition is somebody who is um, a, uh, eligible for membership in a federally recognized tribe. It also, has, it also applies to Indian families, and there's no definition there. So it must mean that somebody who's an Indian and who's got a family is also imp potentially impacted by this. And the, when you have a statute that just says it applies to Indians, the lower courts have struggled with that, but they've come up with a pretty simple understanding of what who an Indian is when the statute doesn't define Indian. There has to be some eth racial ancestry related to Indianness and some indicia of governmental acknowledgement that that person is an Indian. And that indicia could come from a state, federal, or tribal government. So it could be federal. I mean, I, there are a lot of people who are not members of a federally recognized tribe who receive services, for example, from the Indian Health Service. Those are totally Indians, even if they're not a tribal member. So that's sort of the way the rule is. But when you look, when you go um, to the, the current debate, the current uh, case pending in the Supreme Court about the Indian Child Welfare Act, they don't look to anything about why Congress did any of this stuff. There's a reason why they included Indian families is because states were discriminating against Indian families for purposes of foster care. They were basically, most states were saying in the 70s, if you're an Indian, by definition, you're not qualified to be a foster care parent. So the Congress tried to fix that by saying, well, Indian families should be included in a list of people that can be, are eligible to, take, um, to, be, to be foster parents or to adopt ch children. That's all that said. Um, it's, but the Supreme Court is going to, I think they're actually, somebody is probably right now cracking open a dictionary from 17, or from 1977 and looking at the definition of Indian. And that's what they're gonna, that's probably what they're gonna do. I'm being a little bit facetious, but it's ridiculous. And uh, that's what a textualist would do. So if they look at the definition of Indian in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in Webster's Dictionary from 1977, and it looks like it's racially based, they're gonna point that to that and Congress, and they're gonna say in 1978, when Congress said this applies to Indians, they're using a definition that is race-based, therefore it is unconstitutional. That is the line of analysis. The real line of analysis, which is rationally related to the world we live in, which is also the rational relations test, is does this, does this definition or this application have anything to do with the, the relationship between the United States and Indian tribes? We often call it the trust responsibility or the trust relationship. It's also called the duty of protection. And it's what the United States has long, for the, for, since the beginning of the United States, since before the United States, what the United States has understood as the relationship between the United States and Indians and Indian tribes. Um, None of that is relevant to this court, it seems. And maybe a couple of justices will, in their dissents, I'm sure, talk about this. But that's, that's where we are right now. That's what textualism does to Indian law. Thank you. Uh, Siddharth, how, how have you seen this in litigation with the judicial interpretation, social contract, especially in qualified immunity or police brutality cases? You know, it. We use all these different terms, uh, textualist or you know, strict constructionist or whatever it is. It's just a, another way to 
of someone rationalizing their view that they want to make into the order. Um, and, you know, it, there has been a erosion federally um, of, of rights, you know, the granting of qualified immunity, the obstructionism of being able to bring cases. Um, and and it, it can happen for whatever reason somebody wants. And if you're a pro se, it's almost impossible. Um, and even when you have an attorney, um, and I'm gonna remove us out of Colorado, um, even when you have an attorney, uh, you know, you, it's the, the, the process is laborious and it's constantly uh, under 1983, going up on an appeal on qualified immunity issues. And even when you win, then coming back down and you're, you're talking about, you know, decades of litigation for, you know, an act of violence by law enforcement or, or government official. And so in essence, there's really very little justice. Uh, it's very, very hard to get justice. I think Colorado has done a good job. Um, I think we do have a good uh, federal bench. And I think we have a uh, very strong legislature here in Colorado that's been passing rules and laws that allow us to be in state court and state court is much easier. So I would say over the past decade, my practice has shifted into state court um, from being exclusively in federal court and now into state court. Uh, so I don't have to deal with a lot of these issues. Um, it's kind of a roundabout answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Tona, as a policymaker who has worked in both legislative and executive branches, how, if at all, do you see questions regarding the legitimacy of the federal judiciary impact your work or impact efforts to protect civil rights? I, I appreciate that question. And I first want to just follow up on something that a note that Siddhartha um, made in terms of uh, the difficulty in terms of bringing cases, particularly in, in federal court. You know. LDF has been litigating for more than 100 years, um, and that has been critical. The courts have been such a critical place um, to really vindicate the rights, particularly of marginalized communities. Um, and that's, I think, something that's important and that we continue to do, even where, as I think Siddhartha highlights, you know, victory can be very elusive, um, especially today. Um, but I think that's also one of the reasons, because victory can be elusive in the courts, that um, LDF has also uh, sought to really leverage every tool at our disposal when we think about uh, sort of vindicating civil rights. And so that means uh, going to the legislature, um, that means going to policymakers and trying to uh, affect change there. And for me personally, um, you know, prior to joining LDF, I served. Um, in the Senate on the Senate Judiciary Committee on behalf of Senator Booker. Um, so I was his chief counsel. Um, and then after that, I worked in the White House. And um, one, I think, lesson that I took away in terms of policymaking and sort of where um, the, the legislature and the executive branch can sort of impact um, how we think about the legitimacy of our courts is through the judicial nominations process. Um, and so, you know, one thing I think that's important to note is that part of um, why I think folks don't see our courts as being um, legitimate places to bring grievances is because people have not, uh, and historically for a long time, have not seen themselves reflected in the folks who make up our judiciary. Um, and so there's been a lack of diversity, both in terms of demographic diversity, and I think also in terms of professional diversity and really highlighting the rich diversity of the legal profession. Um, and so something that was um, very powerful to see, certainly in my time in the Senate, and then of course in the White House and working on judicial nominations was how important it was to diversify our courts and to ensure that um, people are really seeing themselves in our institutions and in these places um, of power. And so, uh, you know, I think 
it's been great to see some of the strides that have been made in terms of diversifying the judiciary. Um, certainly, we've seen, um, at least in the first part of the Biden-Harris administration, um, more women, more women of color, especially more black women. Um, you know, I certainly know we all um, celebrated seeing the first uh, black woman appointed to the Supreme Court and Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. Um, and I think it's also been laudable to see that we've now had more black women appointed to our circuit courts uh, in just in the first part of this administration alone than we've seen in the entire history um, of appointments. And so that's been an exciting way, I think, um, in which we've sort of been able to recast um, and rethink about the legitimacy of our courts is through the judicial nominations process. Um, and I think that's an important part of the, the conversation that um, we shouldn't forget about when we think about um, the legitimacy of the court. Absolutely, um, pulling themes of that, it's all connected even our education system, we, we need to diversify our schools and professors and students and staff in order to really bring that diversity into our courts and other positions of powers, power. Um, let's talk about federal remedies and how the responsibility of the state, especially with black and Native American communities, uh, how can we make the courts more palatable, more accessible? It seems like there are so many barriers. I remember one L year learning about the Twombly Iqbal standard and felt gutted. So uh, what, what can we do to make it more, more palatable? Uh, Me, <clears throat> well, I would say this, that um, there are some states that do a really good job um, in Indian law. And I think what, how they got to that point is really helpful. So um, 25, 30 years ago, Michigan, Michigan Supreme Court, because of one judge started a, uh, the Michigan Tribal State Federal Judicial Forum that still exists. Um, and just judges on the Michigan Supreme Court have participated in this forum along with tribal judges and state, uh, local, prim primarily trial level judges um, who do work in Indian country. and. The fact that the judges talk to each other, and it tends to be the judges who are likely to, you know, lean in that direction anyway, um, has legitimized tribal courts in Michigan in a pretty dramatic way. Um, it started with a court rule that uh, granted reciprocal, reciprocal comedy to tribal court judgments and orders. Um, a lot of states have that now. It's pretty routine. Not all the states do. Um, that's, that's definitely one way that's been uh, an, an enormous success in Michigan. We, it makes it easier when you have a court rule like that and where the judges are talking to each other for the tribes in the state and local governments to talk to each other and reach settlements and things like gaming and treaty rights issues, um, wildlife management, uh, Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, criminal stuff, probation type, the, all of those things become a lot easier when the judges are talking to each other. Um, other states have been successful in putting native people on the bench, like in Washington and Minnesota and a couple of other states. Um, I love the Washington Supreme Court right now. It is the, the first Supreme Court that has opinions that are rooted in uh, critical race theory, for example, and uh, some of the strongest, and possibly the most strongest Indian Child Welfare Act case came out of the Washington Supreme Court a few years ago, authored by a native woman uh, Raquel Montoya Lewis, who's a former tribal judge um, and a tribal member, went through the Pre Law Summer Institute program in, uh, for American Indian students before she even went to law school. And, um, you know, I, just the fact of her presence on the court has been very meaningful, I think. Um, and educating, you know, it's really hard to denigrate uh, an entire classification of individuals when you have one sitting right next to you who's going to read every internal memorandum that is distributed to the conference. Um, you actually see that a little bit in the United States Supreme Court now since Justice Sotomayor, who is for so many reasons an absolute hero, definitely in Indian law. She is one of the, one of the, probably the only person in the history of the Supreme Court who off to the side when she became a justice said, I'm interested in advancing two things in my time on the court. We all have sort of our special interests. And she says one of those is affirmative action in higher education and the other is Indian law. And that was a total surprise because she had never had an Indian law case before. She was from New York, Puerto Rican, didn't do a lot of Indian law. Um, it was incredible for her to say that. 
And the first few cases she had in Indian law, she was the dissenter, but she dissented in a very scholarly way, a very measured way. She called the court out on its bullshit. Um, like I said, I kind of applied this before. The court, up until Sotomayor came on, could say and do anything it wanted in Indian law, and nobody but law professors, and we don't count, nobody but law professors would call them out on it. It was fundamentally irrelevant what uh, happened to Indians. And now you have a justice on the court who will always call them out. And you actually have two now, Justice Gorsuch, and that's a whole other hornet's nest. But <laughs> what's really important about that is that they can't, um, they can't lie about us anymore, not as much as they used to be able to. I don't know if that's still the case when you have a six to three or a five to four majority. Um, I'm including Gorsuch in the four if there, it is five to four, um, because they can do anything they want. So oral argument, for example, in the Brackeen case, the big Indian Child Welfare, Cat, Welfare Act case, was one of the most frustrating things I'd ever seen because the justices in the majority don't care about um, Indian law. What they care about is uh, advancing a kind of government, a kind of legal structure and constitutional structure that would destroy everything related to Indian affairs. Um, unfortunately, uh, even in the Biden administration, the Office of Solicitor General is not on the side of Indian tribes. Absolutely not. They were technically our co-defendant. They are the defendant in the challenge to the Indian Child Welfare Act, but the attorneys they send forth and the legal strategies, strategies they employ in Indian law cases at the Supreme Court are designed to lose. They absolutely are. And all you got to do is listen to the attorney for the United States in the Brackeen case when the justices are asking questions like, well, if we uphold ICWA, does that mean that Indians own the universe? Could somebody pass a law saying Indians get um, free education? And the answer to that question, if you listen to what I described earlier on, our, on what the rules are, are yes. Congress could totally make Indian education free and pay for it for every single Native person in the United States. But absolutely would be constitutional. What is the United States answer to that? Well, that's a hard case, probably not. No answer as to why that would be the case. It's totally constitutional. Indians are written in the text of the Constitution. Of course, Congress could pass a law that would benefit Indian people in that way. Congress for 175 years, of its first 175 years, passed a bunch of laws that were designed to destroy and kill Indian people. So for them to pass a law that's remedial in a civil rights statute like Indian Civil Rights or the Indian uh, Child Welfare Act, should also be constitutional, but it's not going to be. Um, and that's what's incredibly frustrating by all this. And I started talking about other things outside of the scope of your question. I apologize for that. So maybe we move on. It's OK. <laughs> it's OK. There's definitely a pipeline from uh, foster care to the prison system. So. Oh, yeah, that's true. Too. Yes. Um, Siddhartha, how would you respond to that? Um, which part? Uh, no, uh, no. Uh, how do you increase access to justice? Yes. Or it, it's difficult. Um, there is a, there are not enough attorneys who are willing to take on these type of cases. So uh, our firm's the largest civil rights law firm in the state and in the region. And we get two to 300 calls per month uh, for new people wanting us to take their cases. And it's an impossibility. And not that they all have cases, um, but it's an impossibility. So I think there needs to be more attorneys. There needs to be more programs like Colorado Legal Services and things like that that can provide access to justice. Because navigating the system without an attorney is, it's not futile, but it is fruitless. Um, so I, th I think that's part of it. I think judges have a huge responsibility. Um, I think judges in civil rights cases have a responsibility to uh, when police officers lie on the stand or, or are caught in misconduct, uh, they should report them. They should report them to the district attorney's account, counsel. They should report them to, uh, in Colorado, we have a, like a certification type board. Uh, I, I think those things uh, should be public and they, sh and they should happen. I think when lawyers, uh, prosecutors, for example, um, engage in misconduct, hide evidence, uh, and they should be reported by judges as well uh, and reported to the Office of Attorney Regulations um, and whatnot. And, and absent judges being willing to step up and say, nope, that was wrong, we're not going to accept that, um, the system will continue to 
you know, deny justice because these bad actors will continue to engage in, in bad acts. I think, you know, we also need to do some self-reflection. I'll, I'll focus on the criminal justice system here. Um, why is there a disproportionate number of um, BIPOC and poor people who are uh, criminally charged? You know, look around Boulder. Uh, why are so many Hispanic stopped for some unsafe vehicle, cracked windshield, something like that? Go to the, go to the courthouse down here. Um, and when, and then stop for having some small DUR or some like small amount of drugs in their car or something like that. Uh, when, you know, that, you know, Mercedes Benz SUV driven by the 20 year old kid, you know, you can pretty much guarantee there's cocaine in the car. Um, but they would never stop that vehicle. Um, and uh, because of the consequences to them, because they're gonna have attorneys and, and access to justice. So I think uh, some systems have done a good job. Uh, Jefferson County, Boulder County have done uh, evaluations of who they've been arresting and who's been put through the court system and is there disparity in sentencing? And yes, <laughs> um, are the obvious answers, but they're at least looking and trying to say why and what, how do we stop it? So I think those are some small things that we can do to uh, increase access to justice. And what are your thoughts on that, Tona, of how else can we increase access to justice? What can the federal government do or the judiciary do? Sure, I mean, that's, um, it's a broad question. And I think it, just to follow up on, again, something that Siddhartha said about um, how hard it can be to, to bring cases um, and particularly for people who are unrepresented. Um, but I think it's incredibly important to continue to bring cases um, even when it seems as though, you know, all may be lost, whether that's in federal court or in um, unfriendly state courts, because I think by doing so, um, you raise the costs of some of those um, acts. So I think to, to Siddhartha's point, um, it's an important tool for accountability. Um, and so whether that's accountability through discovery and transparency that you may gain in bringing a, a case or a lawsuit, or that's accountability because you are calling into court and out in public uh, decision makers who have to stand and justify and explain their actions. Now, even if at the end of the day, um, you don't win, I think those are important um, strides to be made and so I think it's important to continue to pursue that. Absolutely, thank you. Um, something you all have discussed throughout this panel is the impact on communities that we are all a part of, and how do the communities in which you work view the judicial system? Uh, and, and yes, so Matthew? That's a great question. So yeah, I come from tribal communities in Michigan, Odawa and Potawatomi, and most people, most Indian people really don't like lawyers and judges. I mean, that's, those are the people that are sort of the soldiers of colonization. So, um, you know, it's nice that there's people like me who are native who've gone to law school. And there's a few people like that in this room right now, which is nice to see. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long road. You know, we're establishing judicial systems where the judges tend to be native, they tend to be, uh, people who have been excluded from the social contract. A lot of former legal aid attorneys end up being tribal judges, um, which is kind of cool. And you don't see that in the federal and state judiciaries. I mean, um, we're follow if you follow the news, you're, gonna, you're seeing about how uh, Clarence Thomas is on the Supreme Court and he has incredibly wealthy friends. And I think that is probably an extreme situation, but fairly typical for federal and state judges. They come from wealth and privilege. They went to fancy law schools. They didn't have debt when they graduated from law school, so they could take a lower paying job, maybe in the Department of Justice, um, and, and, and go through the pipeline uh, of incredible power. And the only really people who can do that, and a lot of Native people can't become, um, work for the Department of Justice in the honors program out of law school because they need to go make money. They need to pay off loans. They need to take care of their families. Um, so when you don't come from wealth and privilege, you're unlikely to go in the direction of the pipeline that leads into high-level political 
uh, hot political and legal areas that lead you to become a judge. And it's rare for um, Native people, people of color, um, people who come from you know, mod modest backgrounds to, to be in that position. And the fact that the judiciary in the state and federal courts is so rooted in privilege and wealth and race um, is dominates our jurisprudence, absolutely dominates it. There's a reason why Justice Alito is asking these questions. Why do we do these things? They're, these things are irrelevant. They're irrelevant to wealthy, privileged white guys like him. Um, when he writes in his statutory interpretation cases, how would an ordinary American understand this word? Um, I know what he's talking about. He means himself. He thinks of himself as the only real American or people just like him. And uh, he's not talking about people like me. He's not talking about Casey Chapito. He's not talking about any people like this. Um, and that's all intentional. And in, in tribal courts, I was referring to this to Siddhartha before we started, we're, we're in an alternate universe where we have judges who actually care about justice. You know, I think that when we talk about justice, I think the anecdote that I remember the best from law school was when, and I probably get these guys' names wrong, but I think Justice Brandeis was on the court, just on the court, and he ended up bumping up against, uh, I think, probably Oliver Wendell Holmes or something, and it's a social thing, like they were in Central Park together. And they talked, and Brandeis asked for all this advice from Oliver Wendell Holmes about what it's like to be a Supreme Court justice. And as they, they departed, Brandeis said, do justice. And Holmes said, no, that is not what we do as judges. That is the exact opposite of what we do, and stop it. And I think that says everything about the state and federal judiciary. When I write an opinion in a tribal court case, I will say it is our job to do justice. And when the Supreme Court writes about something like due process, for example, what does that mean? It means the bare minimum that the government has to give you before it screws you over. It doesn't have to mean that in tribal courts. And we go out of our, at least I do, and some of the judges I work with, go out of our way to ensure that people have access to justice, that they have their day in court. There are courts that I work with where the judge will not talk to a criminal defendant until after they've been assigned an attorney. And uh, nobody pleads guilty before talking to lawyers in Pokagon Band Tribal Court. I guarantee you that's the case. Nobody has to be confronted with uh, ultimatums from the prosecutor's office saying, unless you um, give up your right to counsel, we're going to squeeze you for everything you have. Uh, none, of that, that, none of that shit happens in tribal courts that I work with. Um, it does happen in tribal courts around the country. Not, not, there's 400 of them, so some stuff's going to happen. Um, but it doesn't have to, and that's what's amazing. And in, in a lot of places in tribal communities around the US, um, you're actually seeing people take, take seriously justice and try to intervene in ways that are helpful to individual people as opposed to the institution, uh, which is what the US Constitution is all about. It's not about people. I liked what Matthew had to say about judges doing justice. I, um, you know, and I, I think it's, it's hard to do justice when the person who you are presiding over civilly or criminally comes from an entirely different background, whether it's socioeconomic, whether it's culturally, um, whatever, whatever the difference is, uh, it's hard to do justice. And I think maybe that's why some of these smaller uh, tribal courts are being able to do, do, do justice because um, uh, Matthew can relate to the person he's appearing in front of, uh, maybe not on every issue, but on some, and there can be a connection there and, and they can understand. I think we're doing a better job. I think uh, uh, President Biden and Kamala Harris and Vice President Harris, uh, you know, the, here in Colorado, you know, we have now uh, Gina Rodriguez, Hispanic woman, Cato Cruz, uh, African American man, Charlotte Sweeney, first openly gay judge in the Colorado federal bench. I mean, that's, they're saying we want judges of color who come from, people judges who come from dis, uh, disenfranchised backgrounds, judges who, are plaintiffs attorneys who are public defenders, civil rights attorneys, um, because maybe they can do justice. Uh, I will tell you, um, representing uh, the marginalized, commu marginalized communities in general, uh, that they don't feel they have a fair shake. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting though, there's been a shift. 10 years ago, uh, people of color, marginalized communities looked for white attorneys. Um, 
and they wanted white attorneys because they thought that was the only way to get a fair shake in, in, the, in the judicial system. Today, I will tell you, people of color are looking for attorneys of color. And why? Because it, there's trauma-informed representation. You know, I have gone through what I understand to some degree, I can empathize to some degree, your experience. Um, and that experience of, is in a large part of no one's going to believe me. No one's going to listen to me. No one's gonna care about what I have to say. Well, I'm an attorney and I often feel that way um, in the court system. So I can understand where they're coming from. And I, I, I believe that is the perspective of a lot of people of color uh, and a lot of uh, poorer people um, um, people from social economic disadvantage and backgrounds, that they're gonna feel that same way. Um, so I was just reflecting on Matt's comments uh -huh. and Siddhartha's comments, and I wanted to share an anecdote um, from my time uh, working on the confirmation of Justice Jackson. So, um, uh, part of my responsibility was to accompany her on her meetings in the United States Senate, um, where she met with uh, 97 of 100 senators before her confirmation vote. Um, and I think that was in part why she was able to have a bipartisan vote, um, because she showed she was willing to meet with anyone who um, wanted to meet with her. And I accompanied her on 90 of those 97 meetings. And um, one uh, really special moment that happened that I think speaks to what uh, Matt shared and what Siddhartha shared was uh, we were in the hallway and a young black girl um, approached her. And I think she was probably seven or eight years old. And she walked up to her and she said, you know, one day I want to be a Supreme Court justice, just like you. Um, and that was incredibly moving because I think, you know, growing up, certainly not having seen that representation in our judiciary and certainly not on our Supreme Court, um, you can really see how powerful it is uh, to see yourself represented and reflected in our institutions um, and, and how much that matters. Um, for the legitimacy of, of our institutions. And so I wanted to share that because I thought Matt's comments um, were very powerful in terms of uh, recognizing the humanity of Indians and natives and, and approaching the way that we look at the law. Um, and I really appreciated Siddhartha's comments as well. Thank you. Yes, I would echo everything you all have stated. Um, now, how would you address this alternative viewpoint that this court is just balancing the scales back to an equilibrium, giving power back to the voters, the states, or the democracy? How do we, how do we address that? Well, I, think, <laughs> uh, I think Professor Shapiro addressed it. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 you know, you have a disproportionately high number of Supreme Court justices who have been appointed by presidents uh, who were not, who did not win the popular vote. Um, yeah. um, and so I, I think the narrative is false. Mm -hmm. I will though caveat it and say, there are a lot of people in this country who believe that, you know, as strongly as we believe, and I think history will show that the views that are expressed in this conference are, are the right side of history. Um, but there are a lot of people who believe that, look, the court has been too liberal. Uh, now, I think we can factually use facts and show that that's not true. Those people aren't gonna listen to facts though, um, or science or logic or law or any of those things, but they feel that way. Um, they feel that, uh, you know, it's been too liberal and, you know, whether it's abortion, voter rights or civil rights or, any of the things that we hold sacred to ourselves. Um, they feel that their, you know, uh, their voice isn't heard. And, and we can talk about why, that's a different story. You know, it's the re redefining of the 
narrative of who the actual victim is, that the victim is white men who are accused of sexual harassment. The victim is you know, the person who uh, doesn't get the promotion or get the admission to college because they blame it on somebody else who's Native American or BIPOC or, or, or whatever. And, um, but I think the, the underlining point is they have valid fears. And if we just simply say they're stupid, uh, then we are failing to be able to change the narrative, even though they won't listen to facts and science. No, that's a good point. And I, I would add, I think, with Indian law, over the years I've noticed when I talk to people who are, don't know a lot about Indian law, um, but they, are, they sort of have their pulse on what the, the court, the conservative uh, arm of the court is interested in when it comes to Indian tribes and Indian people. And some overlap with what you're saying. You know, the, the, the themes that I, that I get that push, uh, that end up pushing back against tribal interests are things like um, Indian people are just getting a, a handout from the United States that they're not entitled to, or Indian people or Indian tribes are engaged in governance where they are um, overreaching. They're, they're asserting too much tribal governmental power. Um, and you know, the, the subtext of all of that really is that, you know, their tribes are a third sovereign. They're a huge threat to the United States, to this, this political um, elitism structure that is protected. You know, when, when a tribal government enacts, you know, a, a law like granting uh, personhood, legal personhood status to Minoman, which is wild rice in the Anishinaabe language, um, that's something that people can get behind. And it is, absolutely a threat to um, you know, the kind of people that Justice Thomas hangs out with like in the summertime. So um, why, why all that is relevant is that that's how the decisions that the court starts with those presumptions about Indian people and Indian tribes. Um, and you have to figure out a way to help them get around that. You know, Justice Gorsuch, who's very conservative and you would think would be um, supportive of that, is also somebody that for some reason doesn't buy into those assumptions that the rest of the court has. And that is a, that is a long standing tradition that goes back for, for many, probably centuries at the Supreme Court. So the presumptions that, it, you know, the Supreme Court basically until 2014, um, if, if a tribe or an Indian person was the Supreme Court, their chance of winning was something like 33% throughout the entire history of the United States. Um, and then just for the last, several years since 2014, it's turned around. I think tribes, tribal interests have won like 10 out of 14 cases. That's totally unprecedented in the history of the United States. Um, but I talk to people all the time and they say things like, well, back in the 70s when Indians won almost all their cases, like, please stop. Let's go back and look at those cases. They lost 67% of those cases. What, it, what world do you live in where you think that that's 90%? Where, I mean, I don't understand any of this stuff. And people will put it in law review articles and even students won't even like push back on it. It's these weird assumptions that exist about Indian people and Indian tribes that um, dominate, absolutely dominate the questioning and oral argument. If you understand that that's where they're coming from, that's, you understand where the question, what the questions are going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, the Office of Solicitor General, I gotta bring them up again, they, they possess those same assumptions as well. These are, these are policy choices that the justices are advancing. And those policy choices are similar ones to, that are advanced whenever, um, you know, uh, uh, civil rights cases get to the Supreme Court, voting rights cases or anything like that. And um, that's, that makes it so difficult to, and, and the thing is that there are assumptions that they cannot articulate in an opinion. They can't actually articulate, they'll, they'll, they'll imply them, they'll talk about them in oral argument, but it won't show up in an opinion. You won't actually know why the tribe lost mm. in that case or why the Indian person lost in that case. They, they will say everything but the real reason why that is. Once in a while, you'll see it in like when the papers are released, the justices' papers, Justice Powell's papers are on Vanderbilt Law School website. I have no idea why that is. Maybe he went to Vanderbilt. Um, but there's a great case, the a horrible case from the Supreme Court from called Oliphant versus Suquamish Tribe. And he didn't write the opinion or anything, but him and his clerks were writing memos on, you know, annotating things back and forth to each other. And the fundamental position of the justice was, I have no reason why. To, to think this, but there's no way in hell I can allow an uh, Indian tribe to prosecute a white man. It just can't happen. Find me the law that, to his clerks, find me the law that says that the tribe should lose this case. And when the Rehnquist clerk 
um, who's now a professor at Stanford, wrote up a big, long opinion um, and sent it over. The clerk for Justice Powell said, I read everything. I talked to Buzz. His name is Buzz. I would love to meet this guy someday. I'm not trying to pick on him. He's just doing what his, his justice told him to do. And he said, there's not a single act of Congress that stripped the power of tribes to prosecute non-Indians. And so um, we're going to have to go a different route. And that route was a very lengthy opinion that reads kind of like goulash. It doesn't make any sense. But, um, they, but they, there was no way that the tribe was going to win that case. And the law was irrelevant at that point. And that, it, that, don't, that once in a while, you'll get, like, that's what I mean by when the court doesn't have to try very hard. Um, they do try, but when they come up to something they don't like, they just, just explain it away. And uh, it, fundamentally, what I'm trying to get at is that there's just so much unpredictability and consistency with the court. Um, they don't tell us the truth about what their real perceptions are, where their biases are. Um, so they come up with uh, obscurities to try to, to avoid the actual conversation that they're engaged in behind closed doors. Um, and it's incredibly frustrating because you really, I mean, it's hard to teach a class where 90% of the opinions are not about the case that is pre pre before you. And I think that's true for probably all of the cases that um, are, are the subject of our conversation this whole day. Um, Tona, what is your response to uh, Siddhartha and Matthew in regards to how do we, what do we say when others have an alternative viewpoint? Um, in regards to civil rights and the progression? Um, I mean, I think we can look to history. And um, I think this morning in the keynote, Professor Shapiro made um, a very interesting point about how, if not now, when, and if not us, who? Um, and I think it was an, an important point um, particularly in light of what we have seen uh, our ancestors face in terms of the struggle for realizing um, our full democracy and the full promise of our democracy. Um, and I think before the panel started, you know, Siddhartha made an excellent point, which is when have we seen that as black people, as people of color um, in this country, as Indian people in this country, when have we seen those rights um, fully realized and vindicated. And so um, I think in the face of opposition, in the face of counterpoints, um, it's important to, to keep on pushing and to really use all of the levers that are at our disposal to do so, whether that's in the court or um, elsewhere. Absolutely. And I want to close on this question for all of you. Uh, we hear messages that it takes all of us when it comes to democracy voting, and does this fight for civil rights need more than just lawyers? Do tribes need more than just tribes? Do um, BIPOC need more than just BIPOC? Who else do we need to bring to the table? And if so, how? I, I don't know. I, I, to me, that, and maybe it's just because I'm immer immersed in, in tribal law for the most part. I, I really think that it's not about who you bring to the table. It's what tribe, at least in the context of Indian law, it's what tribes do as governing entities, right? So sometime before I was born in the 60s and the early 70s, um, tribe, tribal advocates, tribal leaders shifted from a rhetoric that was failing of um, human rights and civil rights for Indians toward a rhetoric of sovereignty which is a really terrible fit for us. We don't buy into this notion for the most part that we have to bow down before a political elite that has a monopoly on violence over us, which is what sovereignty is. But it's been an amazing tool because you're speaking the language that the colonizer recognizes. Maybe not the Supreme Court, maybe not the executive, you know, high levels of government around the country, but if you can show that as a governing entity, you're doing a better job than at governing in certain areas than the, the governments around you, that's where, that's where you earn your sovereignty. And that's what tribes, many tribes, not all of them, because many still struggle horribly, many tribes have been doing that. And it's actually been successful to show to the Supreme Court, for example, in a case called McGirt versus Oklahoma, a big chunk of the briefing was, 
who actually does a better job of governing rural Oklahoma in these former reservations? Is it local governments and the state of Oklahoma? Uh, no, Oklahoma is effectively a failed state. It's turned over all of its power to the oil and gas industry. It, it's, it's really good at like, executing people who commit crimes, but um, as a matter of governing, it is a massive failure. And the tribes have picked up slack a lot in a lot of places in Oklahoma, especially the five tribes, you know, Muscogee Creek Nation being one of them. And they're, they're the ones op reopening uh, rural hospitals that have closed because governments can't figure out a way to keep them open. The tribes are the ones who are, who are providing services to Indians and non-Indians in a successful way, in a way that really is a threat um, to the governing institutions of the state of Oklahoma. But that's happening around the country in sort of a micro level. Tribes are cooperating with local governments. They are the ones who are doing a lot of the environmental observation, uh, monitoring, and it, sometimes even enforcement. And they're doing and Indian child welfare, it's not even close. Tribes actually try to rehabilitate families who are in trouble. They try to reunify families, and states do not. They moved as quickly as they possibly can to terminating and breaking up families forever. That is that is the goal of most, it's not supposed to be, but it's the goal of many child welfare, state child welfare agencies. They're just too underfunded. They're terrible at it. Um, tribes are actually doing a far better job. And um, that's where, to me, it's, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of retasking your question. It's not about who you bring in, it's about what you do. And tribes have a very special place in our uh, American polity that makes us uh, true de de laboratories of democracy. Although I will say, as an aside, when it comes to tribal democracy, I'm of the Homer Simpson mind, which is, when will people realize that democracy just doesn't work? <laughs> Thank you. Who do we need in the fight? Um, I kind of look at my clients. You know, we have librarians who refuse to take LGBTQ or critical race theory books off the shelves and get fired. Uh, superintendents of teachers who uh, refuse to eliminate critical race or sexual harassment um, or gender, uh, you know, equalizing policies and they get fired. Um, protesters who lose their eye because they're out there protesting against, um, you know, the murder of George Floyd. And, you know, and just you watch them, the police exemplify the, you know, the violence that they're protesting against. And, and, and I'll just say the three people I just mentioned just now um, are all white. Um, uh, so it, it's, it, is, it is not a fight that we will win, win alone. And I think with some of the opinions coming out, Dobbs in particular, which I think has mobilized uh, a massive part of this country, um, we can't win it alone. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to quote Thurgood Marshall because I think he has an excellent take uh, uh, and had an excellent take on this moment. And that is where you see wrong or inequality or injustice, speak out. This is your democracy. Make it, protect it, pass it on. And so that's what I think when I think of this moment is that we all, as I think Siddhartha was saying, have a responsibility um, to shape what's next for us. And I think um, that is whether you are a lawyer, a policymaker, a business person, an organizer, or uh, who I would argue is the most powerful actor in our democracy, and that is a voter. Um, we all have a responsibility to, to participate. Thank you all for being a part of this panel. I think that is a great way to kind of wet the palette for our next panel after lunch, which is our voting rights panel. And um, I believe that we have an hour long lunch after this and there will be food served and it gives us an opportunity to talk and share ideas 
and also partner and support one another. So thank you all um, for listening. Thank you so much to our panelists. It was just mind blowing and I'm very grateful.